Welcome to another inspiring and timely message from our pastors here at the Crossroads. How many of you have been through storms before? And if not, you're going to be... <laughs> it's supposed to rain in a few minutes, so maybe uh, the great choreographer, <laughs> the Holy Spirit can work it out. But uh, I tell you what, I, I can remember a few years ago, I was uh, on Interstate 10, heading east past Beaumont, and I was coming up on the Louisiana line there, and, and, and all of a sudden it started coming down with rain. But I mean the kind of rain that you see in, in East Texas, that's why it's so green and they got all those trees there. And we were moving into that area where, you know, as you're on Interstate 10, where it's swampland below you. And it's, it's for a reason, right? That means there's lots of water and lots of rain. And I mean, it came pouring down. Talk about cats and dogs. I mean, it was pouring down so hard. I don't know about you, but you ever grabbed hold of your steering wheel a little harder? as if somehow that's going to cause you to have more control. It was one of those moments where I was just I, I was like a little old man driving. I was going like this, you know, because you could only see about 10 feet in front of you, and you're grabbing both hands on that steering wheel, and you're going, Jesus, 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 help me now, Lord, help me now, Jesus. Because you can't see in front of you more than 10 feet. You don't know what's behind you. There could be an 18-wheeler behind you, so you don't dare stop. And you can't see to make an exit. And it's like, okay, Lord, here we go. I'm going to have to trust you. i got to keep going. Well, that's the way it is in our walk of faith sometimes. I can't see five feet in front of me. But I've got to keep going. Because if I try to exit, I mean, yeah, it would be, it would be lovely to exit, put it in park, put it in neutral, and say, I'm going to chill out until the storm passes by. But life doesn't work that way. We've got to keep going. Because if we don't keep going, we're going to get run over. And we don't want to become a statistic. We want to be positioned to where Lord... All I can do is trust you and call upon your name. So we're going to talk a little bit about after the storm and how we respond and how we deal with situations. Turn with me, if you would, to the word of the Lord, to Psalm 116. This is one of my, one of my favorite psalms. They're all so good, but this one especially just ministers to me so many times. When push comes to shove, I go back to this word. And it is, a, it is applicable in almost every situation in my life. And this is called Thanksgiving for Deliverance from Death. Thanksgiving for Deliverance from Death. And it says in Psalm 116, it says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplication. It is good to know that in the middle of the storm, when there seems to be no help, when there seems to be no ability to communicate with anyone else, that Jesus is there above the storm and is able to see into the situation of my heart and my life, and I can call upon his name. I love the Lord because, why do I love him? Because he has heard my voice. First thing I would say to you today is, you have a voice, but you need to use it. You have a voice, but you need to use it. Because he has heard my voice and my supplication. The word supplication simply means a humble request for help from someone who is in authority. If ever there was a time in which we need to humble ourselves, it's when we're going through a storm. We can't have that attitude of bravado. We can't have that attitude of, well, I got this under control. Even in my being able to deliver this message, I'm going to get my tang tangled up. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm not going to communicate it the way I want to communicate it. But if I will humble myself before the Lord, 
and ask for his voice, cry out to his voice, use my voice to connect with him, make my supplication, my humble request. God, help me to do what I am called to do. God, help me to fulfill my obligations. God, help me to get through this today's storm. God, help me to to be able to take that test. God, help me in dealing with different people. God, help me in the different situations of life where it's, it's, it's all cloudy, where it's, it's raining so hard, where I cannot see where I'm going, but I can't exit. There's no way to get off. We're in for the duration. We're in to finish this thing. We've got to keep moving forward. So I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications. Because he, oh, this is the beautiful part. And you have to believe this by faith. He has inclined. He leans in. Even though he's above the situation, thank God he has a different perspective than us. He can see into the situations of our life. Because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I shall live. Do you want to live today? Do you want to just have half measures? No. We want to live. So you need to call upon his name. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. The pains of death surround me. And the pangs of soul laid hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. Let's face it. We're going to find trouble and sorrow in life. Either it finds us or we find it. Quite often we find it because of wrong choices. Because we weren't listening to Jesus. And so we find things that we shouldn't find. But then when we're in the middle of the storm, like wise children, we say, Oh, Jesus, 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 help me now, Lord. I need your help, Jesus. So then I called upon the name of the Lord. Oh, Lord, I implore you. You have to humble yourself. Be willing to say, oh God, have mercy. I implore you. Deliver my soul for your name's sake. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Aren't you glad that he is gracious? Sometimes my attitude was, well, you made your bed. Now lie in it. It's your own fault. You knew better. You should have known better. That would be my attitude. I know none of you are ever that way. But thank God that God is not like that. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. You may need to make that declaration that our God is merciful. I'm not going to declare that our God is not merciful. I'm going to remind him that he is merciful. On the outside chance that there might be that possibility that once again he can deliver me from the hand of the enemy. He can deliver me from the trouble that I have entered into. He can deliver me instead of taking the attitude, well, you asked for this and so that's what you're going to get. I am going to be the first to say, God, deliver me. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. The Lord, and here's a real key for you this morning. It is for me. It, this works for me. The word says, the Lord preserves the simple. When we think more highly of ourselves than we should... And we begin to take this attitude of, well, you have to understand my situation. It's complicated. What I'm going through, well, it's, it, you know, it, it, you just wouldn't understand. As we try to justify ourselves and see something, we come here to an altar and we ask for prayer. And, and we try to justify ourselves, and we say, well, but it's complicated. You know, if, if, if my spouse didn't do this, that, and the other, and if there weren't these circumstances going in my, on in my life, and 
or my job situation. Well, if my boss did this, then I'd be able to do that. But since I don't, I'm not like there or on and on, we come up with all these complications and excuses to make things complicated. But really, it's the enemy of our soul that likes us to, to get caught up in the stuff to where it all gets so complicated, so convoluted that we are like in a maze and we can't find our way out. But Jesus is here reminding us the Lord preserves, he takes care of, he keeps safe the simple. So when you're in a position of humility, you have to say, Lord, I am simple. And I need to make the situations in my life simple and not focus on all these unbelievable amount of details in the way I've complicated things, but to do what we know we're supposed to do. Keep it simple. You don't have to try to figure out the whys and wherefores how to get through the entire storm. All you have to do is focus on what you're supposed to do right now. And usually, that's pretty simple. God gives us simple instructions for today. If you will really partner with him, I believe that he will give you instructions for today so that you have the grace, the unmerited favor of God to get through today. But if we try to justify, if we try to figure all things out, and we try to tell God his business and say, but you don't understand, and this isn't fair, and you know, if I do, if I, if I do what you're really telling me to do, then, then they're going to take advantage of me, and yada, 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 we'll go on and on with all the justifications of why we cannot do what God has simply told us to do. And if we would become simple in our faith and allow the Holy Spirit to focus us on the very basics to get through this day, then I believe His grace will be sufficient and we will be able to do all things through Christ Jesus. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low, but He saved me. Sometimes being brought low is not a bad thing. Sometimes when I'm way up here, I can't see really where I'm going and what I'm doing. I'm not driving at the right angle, the right perspective. But when I have been brought humbled before the Lord and allow him to bring a simplicity back to my walk, then he can save me. He can get me through to the other side. Return to your rest, O oh my soul. The other day, uh, I don't know if she's in here right now, I think she's working in the children's department, but there's a physical therapist in the church that was working with my fingers because I had some problems in my hands, and my wrists, and she was manipulating my fingers. She was bending them. I couldn't believe how much she got to bend my fingers. And I was going, oh, Jesus, 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 Jesus. But you know what? In the middle of it, what she told me to do, as she could tell, I was just, you know, beginning to look cross-eyed at her. She says, Norman, pastor, remember to breathe. Start to breathe. One of those real deep things in life. Norman, breathe. And I started to breathe. And even though she was bending my fingers and I was going, oh, Lord, I can do this. I mean, this little tiny lady was bringing me down low, <laughs> humbling me. I was, I was going, oh, yes, I can do this. I can do this. But as I began to breathe, my body began to relax. And all of a sudden, you could almost hear the popping going on as the fluid was being released in my wrists and in my fingers. And all of a sudden, the things I hadn't been able to do three days previous, all of a sudden it was like, 
That's simple. It's easy. But I entered into a rest. I remembered to breathe. So today, as you enter into your rest, let's learn to breathe again. Let's learn to... There's a word between the different psalms. It's called selah. It means pause and consider. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. Begin to rehearse the good things that God has already done in your life. And because you're not beggars, because you're not just anybody, but you are the anointed of God, those bountiful blessings are never ending. You know, we, 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 we tend to think that, well, it's good up to a certain point, and then because we don't deserve this, or somehow the, there used to be a comedy sh show, and they'd talk about the fickle finger of fate, as if there was some finger up there, some, some God, lowercase g, that somehow manipulated us and that the single thicker of fate was going to be bringing us one of those aha moments in life where you deserve to be crushed. You deserve to lose. But we're not subject to that because we are the anointed of God. Turn to someone and say, you're the anointed of God. You're blessed. You're special. You're just not just anybody. And then say it about yourself. I am special. I am beautiful. I am uniquely and wonderfully made. Verse 8, for you have delivered my soul from death. How many of you want to be delivered from the spirit of death and destruction? When you're going like I was on Interstate 10 and I could only see 10 feet ahead of me. And I didn't know what was behind me. And I couldn't exit to the right or the left. I had to go forward by faith. I needed to be delivered from a spirit of death and destruction. I couldn't see, but I had to believe that there was somebody up above the storm who could see and make rhyme or reason out of the situation at that moment, that precise moment in my life. And I have to believe that there is a God up there who can see through the storm. That he is not so far removed. He is not some God that is somehow distant from us, but that he is present in time. He is both in time and out of time. He is present in my present moment. And he cares about me. And he cares about you. And he's not going to leave you to the fickle finger of fate. You can shake that off of you and say, I am destined to be blessed. I am destined. And it's not an egotistical thing. No, not if you really understand what he is saying in his word. That he has destined us for greatness. He has destined us for beauty. He has destined us to be head and shoulders above the crowd that he might prove that it was him that obviously I can't take myself through the storm. Obviously I don't have enough intelligence. Obviously I'm not strong enough. My eyes are not supernatural eyes, that x-ray vision to be able to see through the storm. But Jesus can and does. For the Lord has dealt bountifully, for he has delivered my soul from death. My eyes from tears, the tears that you've cried in the middle of the night. And my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. You may need to begin to declare that over the dead situations in your life. Say, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I am going to live and not die. Sometimes I feel like I'm going to die a thousand deaths. I know never, none of you ever feel that way. But sometimes I go, how can I possibly do this? How can I face this person because of my failure? How can I move forward? 
But I believe, therefore, I spoke. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Therefore, I believed. Therefore, I spoke. There is something so important about the spoken word. You can think it, but you've got to speak it. You've got to declare it. You've got to let it be noised abroad in the atmosphere that surrounds you. You need to declare it to your friends, whether they believe you or not. You've got to look them square in the eye and say, but God has healed me. And they say, but look at you. But God is, is my salvation. But look at your marriage. But God is going to prosper and bless me. Well, look at how you got turned down for that love. Well, but God is going to bless me. And you need to be de begin to declare the faithfulness of God over every situation in your life, regardless of what you see. You have to believe it, and then you need to begin to speak it. There is something that happens in the atmosphere of faith when you begin to speak it. It's as much for you as well as the spirits around you, the negativity, where you're commanding those spirits to line up with the word of a living God. Either it's real or it's not, but I declare that it is real, and you must declare that it is real. And as you move forward by faith, God wants to set us free. In the land of the living, I believe, therefore I spoke. I am greatly afflicted, I said in my haste. And I even said, all men are liars. You get disappointed in people. They let you down. And even those that you love, they don't always get it. So you have to ask yourself, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? Help me, Lord, to put things in right perspective. Yes, I've been disappointed. People, even good people, have disappointed me. Well, here's a key. Three things here you need to remember. It says, I will take the, up the cup of salvation, and I will call upon his name, and I will pay my vows to the Lord. Three things. I will take the cup of salvation. I will call upon his name. And I will pay my vows. What is that cup of salvation in your life? You are uniquely and wonderfully made. There is not another one like you on this earth. I know your parents told you but then you got to the age where you thought, well, they're just saying that. But you are special. My son, my daughter, you are special. You are unique and wonderful before the Lord. And as you begin to fill your salvation cup with the truths of God's word, and you carry that cup with you, obviously... Part of that cup of salvation is the elements of communion. When we partake of the Lord's Supper and we recognize his sacrifice that has been made for us, we are able to take that cup instead of it being the bitter cup of our failures. It is the cup of salvation where God wants to set us free from our own inability to do things. And we can make our boast and we can lift up a toast to the King of Kings and say, Abba, Father, Daddy God, great and mighty King, look at the cup of salvation in my life. You have redeemed me. You have purchased me with a price. Your blood is in that cup. And I partake of that cup. And I won't let that cup pass away. I am going to let it be part of who I am. And it is my hope of salvation. You have to have that cup of salvation in your life. You need to declare, I am the redeemed of the Lord. I am his son. I am his daughter. Amen. Hallelujah. 
What shall we do when we're in the storm? We have to take up that cup. We have to call on his name. Are we so quick to call on his name? Or are we so quick to call upon our comadre's name? Our compadre. And ask them to figure it out for us. But if we will partner first and foremost with Jesus, I'm not saying God won't use other people. He can and he does and he will. But sometimes we want people's affirmation or we want to make people understand us and all we end up doing is confusing matters more. But if we would take it to the Lord, if we would call upon his name, if we would take that cup of salvation and say, I call upon your name, Lord, you see what you have afforded me in this cup of salvation. And so I call upon your name as being my source, your name as being the answer, your name in being the one to give me the papers I need, your name in giving me the approval I need, your name in giving me favor in every situation, your name. Have you partnered with Jesus to where he is truly declared in every situation in our life on a daily basis? in an attitude of prayer and supplication, that humbly coming before him and recognizing him as our authority in our life. And, wow, this third part, we don't always like to hear this part, but he is graciously telling us that if we want to move forward with that cup of salvation, as we call upon his name, there is a third element And that third element is paying our vows. Now, sometimes we go, well, but I've so royally messed up. There is no going back. That marriage, it's over. I've already lost that job. I've already blown it in one form or fashion or another. But this is the day of salvation. And God will give you the divine direction to be able to pay your vow. And even though we circle way around and we go through so many journeys and so many situations in life, more often than not, he brings us back to the starting point and says, I want you to pay your vow. Now, that might not mean that you get remarried to that same person again. You might be on your third or fourth marriage, so obviously you're not going to go back to the first one. That would be chaos and confusion. But you can't do well in the second or third or the fourth until you make things right in the first. You need to pay your vow. It might... That person might not even be alive anymore. But you still need to pay your vow and release it unto God and say, Lord, I ask for your forgiveness. And Lord, I thank you for healing my heart and I release that person. I release that situation. I release that bondage. And Lord, to the best of my ability, I'm going to do right by this other person. Even in loving them from a distance and releasing them for God's best in their life instead of holding on to them with bitterness and unforgiveness and the bondages and the complication. That's where it goes back to keeping it simple. My child... My child, keeping it simple, that as we begin to pay our vows, it can be something as simple as a pledge that God told us to pay. And the situation may be different now in life, and there really is no going back. But I believe that that's where we have a living God with a living relationship, and he can speak to you on how you can pay that vow in this hour and in this day and see the blessings of God. But see, that's where it goes on to say, 
I will pay my vows to the Lord. Now in the presence of all his people is the death of his saints. I know sometimes I have to die to myself. Oh Lord, truly I am your servant. That's a declaration about who you are, what your relationship is. You're a servant. You're a servant. Say that about yourself. I am your servant, O oh Lord. This is the cup of salvation. I am your servant. I am here to serve. I am a servant leader. I am a servant in all that I say and all that I do. I am here to serve. I am here to be a vessel that pours forth the glory of the Lord. I am your servant, the son of your maid servant. You have loosed my bonds. And again, that's speaking, speaking over yourself. Those areas in which I've been bound in the past, I don't care how many times, I don't care what people have said about you, that you will never do this, you will always be that. But you must say, you have loosed my bonds. Speak that by faith. I will offer to you, and here's a big key right here, I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. The sacrifice of thanksgiving. That's part of that cup of salvation. That's part of the declaration that we make as we offer up a sacrifice of thanksgiving, even in the midst of our pain, even in the midst of the storm where we can't see but 10 feet in front of us. I will offer up a sacrifice of thanksgiving and I will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord. Now in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. I was reminded, salut, I was reminded, the word of the Lord, when it's talked about thanksgiving, how important it is to actually exercise that as a principle. And I prayed and I looked and I said, well, and I was reminded I went to the other gospel. It's a, it's a gospel I, 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 I partake of every Sunday morning, and it ministers to me. It's called Peanuts. It's the gospel of Charlie Brown. <laughs> it's about, I'm a simple guy, so I need to be ministered to in very simple ways. Well, there's actually a book called uh, The Gospel According to Charlie Brown. I don't know if it's in print anymore, but it was, it's really... It, it, it's part of my life, okay? What can I say? But there is one of Charlie Brown's little stories. And he talks about the ten lepers. Now, you remember the story in Luke chapter 17 about the, the ten lepers? It's, and it, in fact, I'll read it to you. It says, Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then he entered a certain village. There he met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. They recognized his authority. They humbled themselves and they cried out to him. So when he saw them, even through the midst of all of the chaos and the confusion and the dust and the storms and the crowds around them, they, he heard the cry of these ten that were way far off because they weren't allowed to even be near the good people. They weren't even allowed to be near people at all. They had to be way off in the distance, but they cried out. And through the midst of the crowds, Jesus heard them. And he, said to, he gave them a specific instruction. Just as I believe God is going to give you some specific instruction on how to keep it simple, less complicated. He's going to give you const constructive criticism. <laughs> He's going to say, in this case, he said, go show yourselves to the priest. Well, in that time, if, if they were healed of leprosy, they had to go to the priest and they had to get a stamp of approval that it was okay to go back among the people. So he said, go show yourselves to the priest. And so it was that they went, and as they went, they were cleansed. Before they even got there to the priests, they were cleansed. Well, here's the point of the story as it relates to us today about Thanksgiving. There was 10, 
Ten people. Ten lepers that were cleansed that day. But only one of them came back to Jesus. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan, which means he was the dog. He was, he was not the, the beautiful people. He was not the accepted one among Israel. He was a, considered a foreigner. He wasn't even part of the blessing. He was of a mixed race. He was of a mixed background. But yet, God healed that Samaritan. And here, Jesus, it was one instance where Jesus actually got a little bit sarcastic. I could hear him almost as he said. So Jesus answered and said, uh, the, uh, Am I forgetting something here? But weren't there 10 people that were asking for healing a while ago? The, the, the were, I'm not mistaken, am I? There were 10, but I only see one here right now. Well, he was the one that came back to give thanks. But in the, the gospel according to Charlie Brown, Charlie Brown was trying to figure this out, and so he was trying to rationalize and say, well, why are the 10 lepers not returning and only one comes back. Keep in mind that these are only suggestions, but they reveal a whole lot about human nature. One of the lepers that didn't return said, I'm going to wait to see if my cure is real before I go back and give thanks. Another one said, I'm going to wait to see if it lasts. Another one said, oh, I, I, when I read this, I thought, uh-oh, this is me. One said he would see Jesus later. He got too busy. I, I, I'll go back. When, when I finish this appointment, I'm going to go back later, and I'm going to see him. I'm going to let him know. One decided that he had never really had leprosy. <laughs> Another said, well, I'd have gotten better anyway. One gave the glory to the priests. Well, it must have been the, those special priests. They, 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 they did something. One said, oh, well, Jesus didn't really do anything. Another said, any rabbi could have done it. And one said, well, I was... You know, I, was, I think I was already much improved anyway. Yeah, I was getting better. Think about it. Are you thanking God for all he has done for you? Or are we like the lepers, rationalizing away God's miracles in our life? Father, would you please give us an attitude not as a cliche, but as truth. Give us an attitude of gratitude that I might pay my vow, that I might declare the faithfulness of God for this hour and see the salvation of the Lord. I don't know what your situation is today, if you're going through a storm, some of you are definitely going through storms right now. And you can't see five feet in front of you. And you're humbled. But take advantage of this humility. Don't be afraid to call upon his name. Don't be so proud that you say, well, I can't admit I need help. We, we all know this. If, you're, if you have a problem with drinking or drugs, you first need to recognize you have a problem. You need to humble yourself and say, Daddy God, Abba, Abba, Father, Daddy, God, I recognize my need of you. And then cry out 
in the middle of the storm and believe that he is there, that he loves you, and he will deliver you. But then after we get out of that storm, it's so easy to become like those other, remember this is nine out of 10? I mean, that's a really poor batting average. (laughs) That only one came back? They all got healed. But the others, for whatever reason, Charlie Brown figured out nine reasons why they didn't return. What's our excuse for not coming back and saying, laying prostrate before the Lord? It's so easy after we begin to feel good to forget. I get it. It's human nature. We all tend to do that. But now is the hour in which God is calling us to be set apart, to have that cup of salvation, to hold it high, to give him thanks, and to be reminded of the mercy and the grace of God as an illustrated sermon of the grace and mercy of the Lord and come humbly before him. The word says that it rains on the just and the unjust alike. We're all going to face storms. But I believe that Jesus wants to take you through the storm today. This is the end of the teaching from our pastors. For more information, visit thecrossroads.org or download our app in the App Store. Thank you for listening.